As Congress resumes and begins debate on how to distribute billions of dollars in aid to Houston and Texas Gulf Coast, we return to Houston to look at who stands to profit from the relief effort and who may not. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're in the home of Professor Robert Bullard, who teaches at Texas Southern University. He used to be the dean at the Barbara Jordan Mickey Leland School of Public Affairs at TSU. Uh, yes, considered the father of environmental justice, uh, deals with the issue of environmental racism. And that's what we're going to be talking about today in the aftermath of this hurricane turned storm. Harvey, who it's affected the most, whose communities will be rebuilt. It's great to be with you, to get to meet you personally in your home, Professor Bullard. Can you describe what happened to you here at home? You thought you were going to be flooded. Well, you know, I had been uh, monitoring the storm. I had been watching TV and getting very little sleep. And then we were uh, informed that we had to, we had a mandatory evaluation. And I heeded that, uh, that call, and I tried to move as much of my belongings from downstairs upstairs. And actually, I used muscles that I hadn't used before <laughs> in that process. And so I uh, evacuated on Tuesday and was able to call a friend and, uh, and was able to uh, take my you know, little bag over and stay uh, until this morning. I, I came back this morning. So in fact, your home didn't flood. No, no, we didn't flood. The water came up to uh, on the streets, uh, around surrounding streets, and some water came on the street, came up to the curb, but uh, it did not flood. And it was, you know, kind of a challenge getting out of the subdivision to get over to my friend's house, but I was able to maneuver and avoid the water and drive my car, you know, uh, in a way that uh, I was not driving into water. But uh, it was a challenge, but nothing like... Uh, like what other people have experienced. You have written so much about and been so deeply involved in issues of environmental racism, environmental justice. Do you see the issue of environmental racism, and I'm going to ask you to define it first, playing out here in Houston around the storm? Well, I think uh, when we look at the, the color of vulnerability and we look at which communities uh, uh, are actually at greatest risk from disasters and floods like this, historically it's been low-income communities and communities of color, communities that live uh, are in low-lying areas that are areas that are very are prone, to, are prone to flooding, and it's very difficult to, to get um, insurance, not just flood insurance, but regular insurance because of redlining. So uh, what Harvey has done is to expose those protection in terms of trying to get out, in terms of transportation, et cetera. I mean, it played out, uh, you know, uh, up close and personal. And I think as we start to see some of the demographics in terms of uh, communities that, that will take longer to return, will take longer to get their um, houses back in order, longer to get their communities and infrastructure back in order. Um, this is not rocket science. And it, those communities that, and, and individuals, households that don't have that cushion to, to uh, ward off that uh, kind of um, disruption, uh, it's always uh, much more uh, difficult for them to return. And I don't see this any different in Houston. And what we have to do is guard against building and rebuilding on that inequity. We just did a toxic tour of Houston. We were over in Baytown uh, next to the ExxonMobil refinery. I think it's something like the second largest refinery in the country. Right by it, people flooded out. And you've got two um, many different aspects of this crisis. But one is the contract workers who work at ExxonMobil, they just lose their jobs when the refinery shuts down, and they also get flooded. And the question is, who will get help and who won't? Um, but 
that issue, for example, while the Republican Texas congressional delegation largely voted against uh, vast um, help for the Northeast during Superstorm Sandy, um, clearly Texas will get billions of dollars for FEMA and to rebuild overall. How do, how is it determined who gets support and who doesn't? Well, you know, the, the way it works uh, is, is those individuals in those communities, those um, um, uh, families and households that uh, have the resources and the wherewithal to, uh, to maneuver through this maze of bureaucracies of filing uh, information online and getting access to the different organ, uh, organizations that can assist and support getting you know the FEMA grants and the SBA loans and all those things. Um, it's not rocket science, but it's not easy to do that. And if you have individuals who are used to uh, getting online and getting access to information and, and processing that, uh, they, they have a head start. You know, uh, there are lots of households right now that are, that are actually uh, hiring contractors that are that have already gutted their houses and they have already you know signed um, individuals on to, um, to 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 fix up and remodel and and bring bring their houses and uh, back to life and it's it's not uh, 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 any mystery as to which com communities that will somehow be the last to do that and uh, these are the same communities that that didn't have access to um, loans in terms of neighborhoods, loans because of redlining, and and what we have to guard against is is this um, uh, rebuilding redlining that somehow allows more affluent communities to access the system, get their communities back in order, and and those who are left behind uh, somehow uh, those areas will be the last to uh, last to, to come back. So it has to be an equitable uh, recovery, equitable development, and to make sure that those families that that somehow may, you know, who's to say that one community should be built or rebuilt, not be rebuilt? And those are policy decisions. And if money is not invested in uh, those areas, and if infrastructure is not in, uh, invested in those areas, and many of the areas in in many of the the communities in in Houston do not have the infrastructure uh, to to protect them from uh, man-made disasters in terms of the flooding, uh, the lack of infrastructure in terms of of the protection. You know, my, a lot of our neighborhoods just have open drainage ditches, gullies, and 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 just very minimum kinds of protection, and so it floods. You know, routinely. And so we're talking about this, you know, biblical flood. Uh, and, and so you can see how not only will they get washed out in terms of, of their homes, they'll get washed out in terms of their, their income. This is the 30th anniversary of the publication of your book, Invisible Houston, The Black Experience in Boom and Bust. Talk about Invisible Houston. In, in Invisible Houston that I wrote 30 years ago, there's a huge population that is still invisible. Houston's uh, demographics, you know, a lot of people like to say we are one of the most uh, diverse uh, ethnically and racially uh, cities in the country. We're the fourth largest city in the country. We are racially and ethnically diverse, but when it comes to economics and when it comes to power and decision making, it stops. And so when we talk about this whole question of, of how invisible how can we make invisible communities visible? Those communities that have been inundated before the storm by pollution, environmental degradation, living on the fence line with very dangerous kinds of facilities, and when a storm like this it ex happens, it exposes those vulnerabilities, and you have the, all of this pollution, you know, all of this, you know, oil and and uh, chemical plants, and that kind of pollution that's that's now exposed in the water, and when the floods water recedes, it's going to left. It's going to leave residue. It's going to going to leave uh, all kinds of stuff that on on the sp school grounds, on the playgrounds, and on people's yards. And so, how we how we're going to deal with that that um, th those sediments that's left? And and we need testing done. We have to make sure it is safe. All the mold we learned from Katrina that people want to get back in their homes and that that in some cases they're rushing to get back without the proper protection. And with the mold in those homes and people getting sick, we have to make sure that we provide equal protection 
and equal access to resources to make sure that we do it right. How do you do that? Well, it means that we have to have strong community-based organizations on the ground with the capacity to assist and support uh, families and households uh, that, can, that can get things right, uh, that can pressure and apply the, the points of saying, well, we need to make sure that just because you don't have a car, just because you don't have you know, a big bank account, doesn't mean that you, you should not be safe, that your community should not come back, and that you should not have the, the, the same level of protection, the same level of, um, of importance as if you were a middle-class white neighborhood. That, that is, that's what we have to ensure. Houston is very segregated along racial and economic lines. And this flood has really shown that. If you look at zip code, you can map where that vulnerability is. You can also map um, how resources have been allocated and distributed over the last 50 years. And so what we have to do is we have to map the resources that come to this region, come to this area, and, and we can show and we can actually fight for it to make sure that, that the resources that flow do not somehow flow in a way that, that somehow leaves those invisible communities. And in, in this case, I wrote uh, Invisible Houston in 87. Uh, Invisible Houston, right, when I wrote it then, was black Houston. But we're talking about a very uh, diverse uh, Houston today, and, and, and the Latino population is almost 50%. So when you talk about the invisibility and you talk about where, those, where the population lives, you talk about not only a disaster in terms of the flooding, you talk about a disaster in terms of the environment, the pollution, the health threats, the potential for, for, for the kinds of, of impacts that we will see you know, years to come. And the most vulnerable in our society is children. And we have to make sure that we protect our children, our vulnerable population. The fact that President Trump came to the area twice uh, but is a proud climate change denier. Um, what does that mean to you, and how does that fit into this whole issue of climate justice in this country, really, and around the world? Well, you know the fact— And your governor as well, Governor yeah. Greg Abbott. Yes, yes. We're, we're in a state of denial called Texas. And the fact is that just because, you know, individuals deny, you know, the fact that climate change is real, that's almost like saying, I don't believe in gravity. But the fact is, the fact is— uh, we're, we're experiencing uh, some very, um, uh, these storms are getting more, um, uh, the fact that. Intense. Intense. And, and Houston has flooded in the last three years. We've had some very intense flooding. And, and frequent. And frequent. So when we talk about uh, what's going on, even if you don't believe in climate change, we have to make sure that our infrastructure, our city, is built in a way that is resilient. And even if you take climate change off the table, the fact that something is going on that is creating a tremendous vulnerability for not just poor people, because when poor people were getting flooded, uh, there, was, there was no concern. But now, because when you do not protect the most vulnerable population, uh, you put everybody at risk. We learned that in New Orleans after Katrina. And so we have to make sure that we protect the most vulnerable population and we b and re re rebuild with the idea that we're rebuilding with resilience. We cannot just, you know, make Houston like it was. Like it was, was inequal very unequal. And, very, and those populations that lived, for example, on those fence lines with those chemical companies, people say, well, what's happening at the chemical company? That, 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 that burnt and exploded, uh, they, they say it's safe. The chemical company says, says it's safe. The, the EPA says it's safe. But I'd like to know, where does the CEO of that company live? If it's so safe, you know what I'm saying? How, how about him pack up and camp out next door? The problem is individuals making decisions oftentimes don't have to deal with the kinds of issues that fence lines communities have to deal with. Even even when we're not talking about flooding, we're talking about the flooding of pollution and chemicals uh, on communities, uh, and people, people don't ask for uh, uh, to be polluted. It's without their consent. 100% of all city-owned landfills are in black communities, even though the African-American community makes something up like, what, 25% of the population here? Black and brown community populations have borne the burden 
even when the population was majority white. So we, we have to really talk about uh, environmental justice. We have to talk about environmental racism and call it out when it exists. We can't just run from it and act as if somehow come by y'all, we all, all going to get along. Yeah, we, this storm has brought the, out the best of Houstonians, but we just can't cover that up. And this, this, this history, this legacy of unequal protection, of unequal access to resources. We're, we're an area that, we're a city that's over 600 square miles, but all, and we have lots of zip codes, but all zip codes are not created equal. And the idea that somehow we can um, not uh, address the economic inequality and the racial inequality as we recover, those things need to be, need to be made plain and upfront and, and just acknowledge. Nobody's talking about let's stop anything. Let's acknowledge that we have to be very careful that somehow we don't, dis, we don't further disadvantage communities that, that have been marginalized because of, of structural uh, 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 discrimination. So Hurricane Storm Harvey hit on the 12th anniversary of Katrina. What worked in rebuilding New Orleans and what didn't 12 years later? This is the 12th anniversary. Yeah, I, I think the idea uh, of communities, residents, uh, or, uh, community based organizations, uh, non governmental organizations coming together, working together, working with government, uh, but, but it being led and driven by communities, decided not somebody parachuting in and coming up with these grandiose designs and saying, well, this is the footprint that New Orleans is going to be. And to some extent, uh, the, the mistakes or the lessons that we can learn is that that local community driven um, where you have involvement, where you have the whole idea of rebuilding needs to be democratized. Those communities, people need to decide what it is that they want and what they can live with. And I think the idea that, that how the money and the funds get spent also needs to be democratized. You can't have a top-down situation where, where shovel-ready projects oftentimes mean processes, um, projects that have gone through a very um, discriminatory, uh, unequal process, and those with power get their projects on top. And those who uh, try to get projects later on end up saying, uh, understanding that, uh, well, the money's gone, or your project is way down the road. I think that we have to you know, learn from uh, Katrina and, and, and Sandy, but I know Houston is different, so we have to make sure that you, we use the uniqueness of our city to make sure that we do it right. And there are lots of groups on the ground and lots of uh, individuals that are willing and ready to uh, do the partnerships to, to work on these issues uh, over the long haul. This will not be a one-year project in terms of bringing Houston back. We know that. You know, uh, New Orleans is, was only a half million people and, and, uh, and, and very compact in terms of its, uh, its, its um, size. Houston is over 600 square miles and, and it's 2.3 million people. It's a lot of people and a big area. So, so you're talking about a big, a big city and so with a very diverse populations. So it's going to be uh, much more complex and it'll, it, involve, it will involve lots more uh, thinking and envisioning and lots more work to make it right. You said you were drafted into the environmental justice movement right here in Houston decades ago. What happened? Yeah, yeah I started uh, my first job out of graduate school in 1976 was uh, at Texas Southern University in 1976. I was a young uh, uh, untenured professor in sociology in uh, 1976, and two years out of graduate school, I was asked to collect data for a lawsuit uh, by my wife who had filed a lawsuit suing the city of Houston, Harris County, and the state of Texas. Uh, and I worked for a state university, so my wife actually sued the, my employer. Uh, and so I had 10 students in my graduate class. She went, uh, we collected data for a lawsuit, uh, Bean versus Southwestern Waste Management Corporation. That was the first lawsuit in the country uh, that was um, uh, challenging environmental discrimination using the civil rights law. And it was basically challenging the location of a municipal landfill that was being proposed 
in a black middle-class suburban neighborhood in Houston. Nothing out in that Northeast Houston neighborhood except trees, houses, and black people. Not a likely place for a landfill. And I collect, collect the data for that lawsuit and we wrote studies and that's how I uh, you know, started working on this. And five out of five of the city-owned landfills were located in black neighborhoods. Six out of eight of the city-owned incinerators were located in black neighborhoods. And three out of four of the privately owned landfills were located in black neighborhoods. 82% of all the waste garbage dumped in Houston from 1930s up until 1978 were dumped in black neighborhoods. And blacks only made up 25% of the population. For me, that was an eye-opening. That's what sent me on my, on my way. So what happened in that original lawsuit? Well, the lawsuit you know, was filed in 1979. It went to court in 1985. And we could not prove uh, intentional discrimination. Even though the facts and the statistics were overwhelming, uh, we had maps and charts. This is long before you know, GIS and iPhones and iPads. We did all the data work by hand, but we actually showed that the pattern was, was irrefutable, but we couldn't prove um, intentional discrimination. It's hard to prove intentional discrimination when, when uh, people are not saying, well, we did it to the black people because we, that's where the landfills go. But unofficially, we were able to document, even without zoning, um, uh, African Americans basically from the 30s up until 1978 was basically was a dumping ground, unofficially dumping grounds. And as the population has changed and shifted, you know, black and brown communities bear the brunt of environmental pollution. The, you talk about the, the, the east side of Houston. I mean, that's basically the area that's unofficially zoned for industrial pollution, even without zoning. Everybody knows that. And, and so when we talk about uh, this whole question of, of, of your zip code can be the best predictor of health and well-being, you lay out the zip codes, the dirtiest zip codes, the most polluted zip codes, uh, we know where they are. They're on, on the east side. We know where the industry are. We know the communities that, that are fence line, that live close to, next to, contiguous with. And when you talk about all of the, the potential health threats and the potential um, damage, not just damage to, to uh, property and, and property and, and, um, and, um, and, uh, and, and, and the tax base in terms of people's houses, you know, lowering the property values, but you also talk about schools and playgrounds that are located so close, you would say, who would do this? And the idea of, of environmental justice and environmental racism and the fact that communities of color are disproportionately impacted by these things, not just in Houston, but that's a national trend. And what we say, uh, people are saying no. Communities have a right to, to say no, and they have a right to equal protection on the, under the law, and they have a right not to have their children uh, go to school or, or, or play on playgrounds that's not uh, impacted by pollution. According to a Texas Monthly article, according to the Union of Concerned Scientists report, the airborne concentration of 1,3-butadine, which causes cancer and a host of neurological issues, is more than 150 times greater in Manchester and Harrisburg in East Houston than in places like West Oaks and Eldridge, relatively different neighborhoods of Houston's west side. Well, what you're saying in that kind of analysis is basically uh, certain neighborhoods are unofficially zoned for, even though we don't have zon zoning, uh, unofficially zoned for the things that other people don't want. And the fact that we have uh, environmental segregation, we have w w w what I call uh, outdoor apartheid. This is basically that those areas, those geographic and spatial neighborhoods that, that somehow are considered compatible with these types of facilities. And we know that the impacts of living close to with these emissions or with explosion or accidents or, or releases that may come from flooding, uh, like Harvey. I mean, we know which communities are impacted, and that's, that's the justice question. And when we talk about how will we uh, rebuild, how will we, re, uh, we recover, um, and how will we uh, redevelop, those are questions that, that, that we have to answer uh, in a way that, that's uh, acceptable in terms of these legacy uh, residuals of pollution on neighborhoods that, that uh, have, have really just borne the burden for all of these years. So how do you deal with industry so powerful here in the Petro Metro? I mean, this is the heart of the fossil fuel industry. 
Um, you have city-led initiatives consistently challenged by the Business Coalition for Clean Air, which is an industry lobbying group that represents ExxonMobil and other companies. Uh, last year, it convinced the Texas Supreme Court to strike down Houston's Clean Air Ordinance, which was adopted during Mayor White's administration. That's basically overruling home rule. It's basically saying that, you know, the fourth largest city in this country that took the initiative in saying we want to, you know, have uh, clean air and we want to uh, be uh, uh, more sustainable in how we do business. And again, uh, you have to understand that there is no level playing field uh, in, in Texas when it comes to uh, the, the, the chemical industry, the petrochemical industry. You know, there are equals, uh, there are equals and there are equals. And the fact is that there is no level playing field. Uh, the, the communities that have been uh, suffering for all of these years really don't have a voice. They are still invisible uh, and they are still underprotected. And as I said before, the, the most, uh, the most uh, vulnerable population uh, that we're talking about is children. And if people don't get angry or somehow concerned about children going to school or playing on playgrounds, that's on the fence line with uh, companies that's pumping out dangerous chemicals and creating lots of environmental hazards. I, you know, you, you have to understand well, what kind of, of person would somehow just, you know, turn the other way or governmental entity that would turn the other way and say, oh, it's about regulation. We need fewer regulations. And because the companies have to be competitive globally and therefore the community that's on, this, on the fence line basically is the sacrifice zone. And what we say in the environmental justice community, we, 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 we say no to how communities being sacrifice zones. What is the role of historically black colleges and universities like TSU, like Texas Southern University, when it comes to environmental justice? Well, you know, historically black colleges and universities have always produced uh, students and leaders that have fought for justice. And whether it's the civil rights movement, peace and justice movement, et cetera, and the environmental justice movement is no different. The climate justice movement is, is no different. And what uh, some colleagues and I, uh, Dr. Beverly Wright at, uh, uh, in the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice decide, in New Orleans, decide, we decided that we will start to pull our historically black colleges and universities together because many of our schools are located in the heart of these toxic sacrifice zones. Many of our students come from these universities, and so we're saying we've got to, we have developed this uh, collaborative, this consortium of HBCUs to work on environmental issues, climate issues, energy, housing, transportation, uh, and other issues, food security, and we're saying that we're going we're gonna, to um, uh, provide a new generation of leaders to work on these issues and form partnerships with other, other organizations and groups. And our, you know, just in January, our uh, consortium was funded, you know, with a grant from Kellogg Foundation to pull these meetings together, to pull our organizations together, and to do the kinds of things that impacts the most vulnerable, children and families. And so what we're saying is that our institutions have to be leaders. We can't follow, because if we follow, our institutions will go under. Our institutions go under in terms of economically, but also will go on in terms of, of, of rising tides, water, you know, being flooded out, uh, being, uh, being basically not competitive in terms of what we can do uh, in terms of sustainability. Can you make a connection between environmental justice, environmental racism, and gentrification? Uh, what many talk about is overdevelopment here in Houston. Yeah, when we talk about this whole idea of building healthy, sustainable, just communities, uh, that whole idea is to address the historic nature of, of as communities become greener, more sustainable, um, and oftentimes when you start developing their resilience plans, oftentimes those communities if they are in urban core areas, neighborhoods, et cetera, uh, they oftentimes push out low-income communities, uh, people, and push out people of color. And what we're saying is that, that, that our communities, communities of color, want to be sustainable, want to be resilient. They want to be uh, healthy and livable. And 
it should not somehow be uh, something that's relegated to white middle class, uh, suburban, or urban core. The gentrification that oftentimes occur, uh, occurs in many of our communities, uh, it's, it's, it occurs at the, at the, 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 I guess, the detriment of communities that, that have historically lived in those areas. Uh, and as you see those, see those areas start to come back, you start to see all kinds of services and uh, parks and green space and grocery stores, no sound anything. Well, we have to say that we want to make sure that, that we redevelop and we develop our communities in a way that minimizes displacement of the incumbent residents and also ensure that those residents who want to remain in those older neighborhoods that are undergoing transformation, that they can. And those who want to leave by choice can leave. And, and it means that when tax dollars are being used, we have to make sure and ensure that tax dollars are not being used to subsidize those kinds of, uh, those kinds of structural uh, discrimination that, that somehow people will say, well, we didn't mean to do that. We didn't know. These are the unintended kinds of consequences. But as I said before, if you think about and, and calculate out when poor people compete against people with money, you can almost, you know, bet on who's going to win. And so this is, so we want to cr create winners uh, in those various income groups uh, and so that we have, um, you know, communities that, 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 that are uh, multi-income and, and multi-ethnic uh, uh, and, and, and create uh, communities that's livable and not just, you know, these yuppie playgrounds uh, that, that somehow have, have put up fences and walls and, and people who used to live there have to get, you know, a pass to drive through or walk through. So how do you fix that now, after the storm, after Harvey? You wrote a book, Wrong Complexion for Protection, How the Government Responds to Disaster Endangers African American Communities. How specifically, with Mayor Turner here in Houston, do you think this can be turned around right now, with that this somehow, horrific as it is, could be an opportunity to challenge the patterns you describe? I, I think we have an excellent opportunity to to address some of the legacy issues of, of uh, institutional redlining and neighborhoods that have been allowed to decline and, and areas that have somehow uh, been invisible. I think this is a great opportunity to plan for a, f uh, a complete uh, community and a complete revitalization, a complete recovery. And that, that, that this, the old way of doing things, I think we need to throw it out the window uh, or put it in the trash bin. And the idea that we can bring our diverse city to the table with diverse stakeholders, diverse individuals that are in the room. Which should be the first step. Which should be the first step. This should not be a top down. We need to, I mean, we need to take stock of the fact that Houston is very diverse and there are lots of layers of that diversity. And so we need to make sure, we need to use our institutions, our community-based organizations, our non-governmental organizations, our faith-based organizations to plan for and get the input to, so that we can, we can do it right. I mean, again, it's, it would be very easy to turn this over to planners and say, plan it. Go in the room, come back with or this nice Or who's getting the billions now? Yes. Red Cross, yes. for example, which is yes. not exactly a local well, community-based organization. We have to, yes, there are issues there. And so we have to, we talk about new, um, new kinds of models that I think uh, over the last, you know, 12, 15 years that we're learning uh, from the things that didn't work. And those things that worked, uh, we need to model them. We need to scale them up. And, you know, the, the idea of bringing community leaders and faith leaders and community-based organizations and institutions um, that have lots of, of expertise uh, in the process of working with communities. And a lot of times, you know, communities that have historically worked with, for example, our historically black colleges. I mean, we have a long-standing relationship with communities and neighborhoods and areas that, that uh, somehow have been forgotten, left behind, or invisible. And so it makes, whole, it makes a whole lot of sense that we should be in the room, at the table, uh, working with those communities. When the money comes down, we should be able to talk about, let's follow the dollars and make sure that the dollars don't get lost somehow or diverted to uh, pet projects that have nothing to do with bringing those communities back. 
We learned from New Orleans that in some cases money was diverted to areas that didn't flood, areas that, 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 uh, that, that was most in need somehow, had to wait the longest to get the money, to get the flood protection, to, get the, to start building resilience. We, we should learn from those mistakes and not just uh, act as somehow that we don't have any uh, understanding of how politics works or how disaster capitalism works. We know how it works. And so we have to do is Explain is what sure. you mean by disaster capitalism. Well, you, you, you're talking about how money comes to areas after major disasters and billions come flow in, and then you have all kinds of organizations and individuals parachuting in, uh, raking up the money. I mean, when the local groups that have been working on these issues for years and years and years somehow get bypassed, uh, get left behind. Uh, and so the idea of contracts that are already, you know, being uh, pushed out and, and no bid contracts, you know, uh, very, um, what do you call it, exceptions um, uh, uh, being made in terms of environmental exceptions. So you get, a, uh, you get a variance or you get, you know, something that's basically, uh, well, we're gonna, that rule is not going to apply because this is ex ex uh, extraordinary circumstances and so you get a waiver. I mean, we have to watch everything that's going on when it, when it comes to how uh, money is being spent and how the city is being, um, how, how, how plans are being made as to which areas are going to come back first and which areas are somehow going to say, well, you're going to have to wait because you got so much damage, uh, you, it's going to be hard for you to have a shovel-ready project. And so, so, so not having a shovel-ready project because you have been, you know, flooded under or because a lot of the people devastated. you've been devastated and you're, you're not just your your family but also your social network your organization have been destroyed and so new organizations parachute in uh, and and generally grab the money because they're up and running they got all that infrastructure in place and and next thing you know you get people applying for grants and what what i'm not saying that's going to happen what i'm saying is that community organizations institutions um, that have been doing this work in the city for many, many years, uh, they need to be funded. They need to have, they need capacity to staff up and, and to start doing the kinds of work uh, because they have the trust and because they have uh, the experience and because they are here, they are local. That needs to happen. We're speaking in the Petro Metro. I mean, this is the heart of the epicenter of the fossil fuel industry. Republican legislators, Congress members, uh, the governor lobbied hard to deregulate the industry. It's more powerful here than ever. How do you take that on? What is the role of these industries now in determining who has and who doesn't have? And not to mention who has clean air and who doesn't. Yeah, well, you know, we, we are in the belly of the beast, and, and uh, that's, uh, th you know, we can't deny that. But because of those facts doesn't mean that we have to basically uh, resign ourselves that, that we should take less. We should have less. What we have to do is, is, is keep fighting and keep presenting our case that, that clean air is good business sense. Having a, a city that's rebuilt uh, and, and redevelop and redesign in a way that will, that will shore up and that will minimize the, the, the future floods and the future impacts of, of hurricanes. Uh, we will have more hurricanes. We will have more floods. And, but the, the thing is, how do, we, how do we build, rebuild in a way that, that will make our city more resilient? How will we basically incorporate a model that is inclusive and, and, to, and to develop, you know, strategies to lift all of the boats, to lift all of the communities, and not just the ones that somehow uh, have resources and bank accounts to, to get their things back in order and, and go about their business as if the city is open for business, is normal. No, there are people that are, will be in, in temporary housing for months, and in some cases, many months. And so neighborhoods that will be, um, that will have uh, uh, the yellow tape around them for many months. Some communities will bounce back quicker. We cannot leave any community behind. We have to bring all of our communities back up to a level, uh, not just where they were, because if you bring them back, many of our communities back to where they were, that is, that's the inequity 
that has that has been perpetuated for decades and probably centuries. So you were the dean of the Barbara Jordan Mickey Leland School of Public Affairs at Texas Southern University for a number of years. What do you think these icons, these two Congress people, Barbara Jordan and Mickey Leland, would do now? Well, well, these two icons, they will be out there fighting. They will be out there uh, resisting. Uh, they will be out there um, uh, 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 talking and doing and and out there basically uh, uh, saying and 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 pushing, pressuring to to make sure that that justice and equity and fairness um, become the centerpiece of any rebuilding program or any recovery program, and making sure when the money comes down to Houston, and the money will come down, uh, we have to make sure that that uh, it, it, it flows in a way that does not perpetuate or exacerbate or to or continue the inequality that existed before the storm. Now that's the challenge that we have to have to uh, address. Do you think it's possible to make invisible Houston visible? I do. I do think it is possible and I and I think that uh, that it's necessary. You know, this is not a this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. This is going to be many years of working on this to get it to the level that we're talking about. Uh, we're not just talking about, you know, band-aids. We're talking about a total uh, uh, reforming the way that, that resources are, are, are spent and the way that communities uh, get lifted up in terms of priorities. Now, that's, that's going to be a challenge because there are still forces that, that want to do, you know, what's easy. And there are still forces that, that uh, don't acknowledge uh, the inequality in our society or inequality in our city. And so we have to, we have to continue to challenge that. Uh, we're not, you know, every day 24-7 saying we're going to be adversarial. We're talking about uh, fighting for justice, fighting for the vulnerable population, fighting for children. Who, who, you know, I can't think of anybody who's not for having children uh, being protected, you know, who, who's going to stand up and say, um, I'm for poisoning children? I don't, that's not, you know, PC. Well, that's really interesting because in the midst of this hurricane and its aftermath, you have two major anti-immigrant issues. Uh, SB4, which a judge just postponed in the middle of uh, the hurricane, and then you have DACA. All through this weekend, President Trump deciding whether or not young people in this country who are not born here but came here at an early age, we're talking 800,000 in the country, maybe 80,000 here in Houston, uh, will be able to continue with uh, to work and live here legally. Um, what about that? And also when it comes to immigrants, who will rebuild this city when so many are afraid of coming out of the shadows, afraid that they could be arrested, even were afraid to go to the convention center or to come out anywhere, to leave their homes when they were being flooded, afraid that perhaps they would be picked up and deported? Yeah, yeah this is the invisibility that becomes so, I guess, detrimental to uh, our society when when it's uh, in some circles become acceptable uh, for uh, populations to be placed at risk or to somehow be denied basic human rights and and the idea that that a family uh, because it's you know afraid to come out afraid to you know go to the convention center afraid to somehow um, uh, voice uh, their 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 their, their whole conditions that, that's life-threatening, that to me uh, does not uh, signal uh, what's good in this country. We have to do, we, we are better than that. And I, I think uh, a lot of this uh, is tied to this whole idea of uh, trying to score political points or trying to somehow uh, give the idea that, that uh, there has to be um, the boogeyman or uh, an other to somehow bash. And uh, I'm hoping that, that uh, this city uh, will rise above that. And, and as I said before, you know, you look at the demographics of this city and you can't, you know, get around the fact that a, a huge, almost half of the, of the population in this city is Latino.
Uh, and and when you talk about flexing muscles, I mean, that population and its allies will need to flex muscle when it comes to what happens to those, uh, po those uh, communities that have large uh, numbers of, of undocumented um, uh, residents in these, in these areas. And so the, the fact is that no community or no population or no family deserves to go under and not have some type of, of uh, assistance. My, that is inhumane. And I would hope that, you know, in, in America that we would uh, be much more humane uh, th than to just turn our heads and, and look for whether or not you got a, uh, a card that says you are a U.S. citizen. I mean, let's be real. We have to be uh, compa compassionate because w this flood is, is, has devastated this city. Some hurt more than others, but we just can't turn our heads and say we are not going to be sensitive and humane. That's not, that's not American, I don't think. So the storm and the recovery takes place in the era of Trump. What is your assessment of President Trump? Well, he is the president, and I, I'm hoping that, that, uh, that our society will, will basically start to, you know, come together and, and agree that there are certain principles and certain, um, I guess, beliefs uh, uh, that, that this country has stood for for many years. And, and at some point, I, I think, you know, uh, people are going to have to say that we have to, you know, come together and, and the way that we've been, you know, torn apart, uh, I don't think we can, uh, we can last uh, very long with that. Well, Newsweek has named Professor Robert Bullard one of 13 environmental leaders of the century. The Grio named him one of 100 black history makers in the making, and Planet Harmony called him one of 10 African-American green heroes. It's been a pleasure speaking to you here today, uh, and I'm very glad we could be sitting here on the first floor of your home without our feet in water. My pleasure.